and our responses, particularly in the light of, of uh, fresh water and carbon. Um, and, and that's fantastic and, and, and essential, of course, but it's very easy to lose sight of, of a couple of things. One is that um, people need to be able to farm profitably, uh, they need to be able to farm productively, and they need to be able to fit farm systems to the, uh, the land and the climate and the people in a way that um, provides the best outcomes. Um, and that is, and this is where I'm heading, that, that is a complex jigsaw puzzle. Right? It's, it's not easy to kind of say, um, how, do we, how do we fit a farm system best to the land and everything else that goes around that. And it's very easy in today's world of sort of 20 second sound bites to look for what's the silver bullet. Oh, we just feed, feed our cattle seaweed and we'll be right, or whatever else it might be. And we know that farm systems are complex, they have feedback loops, it's not that simple. Uh, and today we have some people in the room who have some fantastic experience and some learnings from working through farm systems in both a, a research and a practical way. So we're very excited to, to hear from those people. I'm going to invite Graham Ogle to come up now, and um, Graham's going to jump up and down during the day, uh, introducing people. Uh, and uh, I guess Graham has done a lot of work um, in recent weeks, working with many of you, organising today, and uh, on behalf of Rosia Systems, um, we're very grateful for that work as well. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Rosie has been planning to run this workshop for quite some time and it's um, a real pleasure to uh, have a room full of all the people we want here for this workshop. Um, <coughs> what I want to do is just cover why we're running the workshop and a little bit about how. Um, I think this is a, a, a chance for... Rosie has been looking for the chance to have a bit of a... Um, and I found the word the other day, a policy refresh. A strategy refresh, sorry. Um, very cool word. Uh, and we thought, what a better way, what better way is there to have a strategy refresh than invite all the right people, and you're, we think you're all the right people, to, to a venue and talk about what we see as really valuable to farmers. What is value? What is value when we say, of all the things we could provide a farmer, what are the valuable things? I, I guess I started my career, my idea of that uh, really was forged out of when I started my career in the 1980s, which meant that I had two decades of excruciatingly low product prices to work with for farmers. Uh, I remember sitting with a farmer one day, he was in trouble, the farm was going to get sold up, and I thought, if we get $35 a lamb, you'd be right. And of course, the markets weren't delivering that. N now, you can adjust that by whatever you like, whatever inflation index you like. The CPI would mean that farmers today would be getting $55 a lamb. And I imagine our budgeting would be even more difficult today given the increase in costs. Dairy farmers were getting $2.40 a kilo of milk, milk solids. I mean, it's almost unheard of. And if we ramp that up by the CPI, we'd be talking about a payout today of $3.70. So this, this was a sort of the anvil that forged my early career. And uh, going out to do things for farmers that were of value, the biggest value we could do for farmers then was increase their profitability. And that uh, started to address all the other problems that were on the farm. So, <clears throat> when Rosia set out, as we, we did uh, in 2004, uh, as a group dedicated to agricultural uh, software development, often we sit around and think, is our strategy aligned with where the value is in the industry? Are we aligning our investment and resources where the value resides in the industry? So what we're going to do today is we're going to think how might we align our investment with what top farmers are saying is important to them. And I can't think of any better way to start this workshop than listening to some top farmers. So that's what we're doing. 
I think uh, consulting is also an extension of farming, and we'll listen to consultants after that. The farmers that we'll listen to have been through some process of change or intensive planning. Um, and it's from those discussions that we hope you'll pick up some things about what they value. And maybe uh, a, a successful outcome of this workshop is if you go home and think, hey, maybe we need a strategy refresh as well. Okay, um, what I want to talk about is the pasture growth forecaster. And of course, I'm the last speaker of the day, so I've got to make it exciting for you. Uh, pasture growth forecasting, are we, uh, we, we, we have a model, uh, which is licensed from Dairy NZ. Uh, we have a commercialisation agreement with them. And that's available and we, as a wholesale service to people who use those pasture growth rates in their systems. So we, we're a kind of a wholesaler uh, of, of the service. Okay, so wh why is pasture growth uh, forecasting relevant? We think we're in the core um, for where value is in New Zealand uh, by being in the pasture growth forecaster business. Um, you, because New Zealand is, is unique in its agriculture. Whenever we go to Australia or, or South America, um, it's really hard to, to take those technologies with you. You know, uh, when I first took Farm Max to Australia, um, I went over and had a look at the farm that was being modelled and it had five paddocks over 2,000 hectares. And, uh, and he had run out of grass. And, he, and I said, well, what, what do you normally do? And he said, oh, yeah, dig a big hole, basically. There was no sales strategies for them. It was, uh, I, I said to him, I don't think Farm Max is doing any good. And he agreed and we pulled out. So, so New Zealand's unique, though, uh, compared to that. Uh, it's based on, our grass is relatively cheap. We don't have to sow it first and, and, and harvest it and then re-sow it. Um, our profit is directly related to the skill of the farmer in feed planning and pasture management. Um, and I, I think New Zealand farmers are in a really unique situation in that the full-time farmers you go to the UK and everyone's got 400 ewes and it's only a part-time job. And it's very, very hard to keep the attention of that sort of industry in terms of profitability because they're depending on an outside job. Okay, uh, New Zealand has great, great modelling uh, heritage as well, uh, better than any other country. Uh, we, we have uh, big models doing uh, commercial work for us, like Overseer and the genetic uh, engines and Diagad and beef and lamb genetics, uh, farm max and the pasture growth forecaster. Out of all of those, uh, models actually touch the lives of every farmer in New Zealand. Um, yeah. Is better pasture management worth it? So when I prepared the slide, I read a number of um, um, papers in the dairy industry. I, I, I'm not, a, I do more sheep and beef, but um, from what those papers um, from Adrian Van Beisterveld and Piers Birks uh, said was there's about a 7%, seven percent, seven and a half percent improvement that can be made in pasture production on an average dairy farm. In the sheep and beef industry, um, the work I did during during my time at Farm Max, we calculated that the potential there was about a 15% um, improvement. Um, in pasture utilisation. So when you take it over to the operating profit, dairy, uh, that's worth about $385 a hectare. And in sheep and beef, it's worth 242. But with sheep and beef, we're only making 500 to start off with. So a high performance system will actually improve our profit uh, per hectare by 47% compared to the dairy 13. So there's a huge potential in the sheep and beef. Now, I've just got to say that uh, I did this before the Lamb said $8, $8 a kilo, uh, it's just getting better. I think we've got to realise that every farmer in New Zealand is playing a uh, pastoral game. It's like trying to keep balls in the air, pasture cover, pasture cover's declining, oh goodness, the prices are going down, you know, and what, what should my stock policy be? Look, uh, farmers make decisions like Hey, it's pretty dry. What's the next two, two weeks climate going to be? It looks like it's going to be dry. 
what decision shall I make with the milking herd? Uh, there's a lot of money involved in that decision. Can I keep an extra 1,500 lambs? Well, that's um, 150,000 bucks right there. So they are big decisions. We play a game and the chips that we're using, are, farmers don't realise it, but the chips they're using are really big ones. Um, and if they look at that and think, right, I need to have that supported by some pretty intelligent software, um, we'll get a um, higher sort of hit rate in, um, in getting those decisions to be the right decisions. Now remember, farmers need to make more right decisions than wrong decisions, otherwise they haven't got much uh, time left on the farm. So what would be required for perfect pasture management decisions? If we had timely, effortless biomass ass assessments for each paddock, like dairy farmers currently get with space, accurate pasture growth rate predictions for each paddock for the period of the decision making, and livestock price forecasts. If we had all that, then it's just computing to work out what's the optimum strategy, right? We can take all that information and give it to a farmer and he can think and look out the window and think of the optimum strategy, or we can put it all into a computer and ask it to do 100,000 calculations in one second. And the point I'm making is it's a computational problem. It's not anything more if we've got the data coming in. So we, we can actually determine the ultimate stock policy if we have enough CPUs and the right information coming in. It is possible. Okay, so on the, onto the pasture growth forecast and model. In the green, that's the kind of information it's, that's required to run it well. So we need to know about soil moisture holding capacity of the soil, and that's why we're so interested in the SMAPS development. So we're first on your buy list uh, when you get that API running for our sort of company. Um, climate, we get that from Niwa, and we're always in, uh, interested in, in continuous improvement. What is the farm system? We have different settings for dairy, we have different settings for sheep and beef. We have different settings for fertility, um, and we're, it'll take into account irrigation, and also it takes into account your current pasture biomass, so if that grows too high and the pasture cover gets too, too long, then the decay rate increases and your, your net growth will uh, go down. So the pasture growth forecast uh, provides um, services for producing potential growth and net growth. So the difference between potential growth and net growth is what it could, could produce if the pasture was kept at the right length and grazed um, at the right frequency. Net growth is after you've done it either well or made lots of mistakes. We also provide a learned growth rate. So if you supply us with what you think your growth rate was for a period, then the model will look at the parameters and come back with a far greater accuracy forward prediction. Uh, so to give you an idea, um, learning takes it from an R squared of about 0.65 up to 0.8, and 0.8 is very good. It means 80% of it, the model knows about 80% of what's going on. So here's uh, output from the pasture growth forecaster. It's a 14-day forecast. The last two, it's a bit confusing because the last two uh, squares there are both five-day averages, whereas the previous green ones are, are, are daily. So if you look at the top one, that's on uh, high fertility. Uh, Low fertility and the bottom one's on high fertility. So you see one month there at low fertility, you'd produce 11 kilograms and high fertility, you'd produce 19. And that's the effect on potential growth of uh, fertility. Uh, here's our, our learning al algorithm in action. So the top one's not been learnt, and that's the growth you would get. We call that a raw growth uh, prediction. It doesn't know anything about your farm yet, and the bottom one knows something about your farm, so it's giving you a much closer fit. Okay, I'm um, coming to the end. What, what are our priorities? Uh, um, I thought it would be good at this session for us to 
give you a bit of an idea of what our shopping list is so that people could look at it and think how they can help us with it. Um, we've got three we, uh, what we call reseller sites, Dairy NZ Farm Max and Beef and Lamb. Um, we'll be taking over those sites uh, because those companies um, think that we may as well do it because we have plans for how we want to evolve those, uh, that website. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback on what would be really good. We want to implement it. The three resellers are a bit reluctant, so we're going to take it over. And uh, we hope that'll get a lot more uptake uh, in the paid service. Uh, we need to continue to improve the model, and in particular, it's senescence and decay, which we think it's currently not accurate enough. Um, and we've got some very good da data from uh, Dairy NZ. Thank you, Chris Glassy. Uh, we'd like to get integration with water holding capacity from uh, SMAPs. And another one that uh, we'd be very keen on is uh, uh, getting an auto validation uh, running with the Ag Yields database where we can take real data and automatically learn and validate um, all of the grids we've got across New Zealand. We've got 11,000 grids across New Zealand, and if we get many of those already calibrated, uh, we'll be giving, getting um, even better data out. So, in summary, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the holy grail. Um, Adequate information and accuracy to win the pastoral game. The important bit about the pastoral game is you can't lose the pastoral game and also be in the top 10%. It, it, there is a group of farmers who win the pastoral game and they're all in the top 10% unless something else is going wrong. But there is not a group of farmers who get, get their pasture management just a bit off all the time, but they're in the top 10%. It doesn't happen. There is that no group like that. Most farmers have no metrics about pastures, and to enter the metric world is quite a step up. Uh, the biggest step up problem that they have is measuring pastures. And I don't know how many tens of farmers I've helped measure pasture covers, but the thing I always find is that they don't, it's not just the day going around and measuring all the pasture covers, it's the feeling you get when you get home and you think, I don't know whether I was right or not. It, it seems like a waste of a day. And uh, if you can't get confidence in it, uh, you're, you're never destined to carry on with farm max. It's just as simple as that. So how can we give people confidence in measuring pasture covers? Um, I, I think when uh, we, we're producing uh, very accurate results, and, and it's also ha it's happening now, uh, people are using our data and they're rolling it into their services. They're creating innovative interfaces for their uh, farmers to use our service, the Pasture Growth Forecaster. Um, so I, that's how it's going to get its uh, penetration. And I, I'd point out that good models last a long time. Uh, the Pasture Growth Forecaster, that it has an equation, a rather large equation, and that runs 2.4 billion times a night. And it hasn't worn out yet. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with that thought, that when you invest in a model, it doesn't wear out. And it's about the, being in a mathematical formula, it's about the clearest way you can express what you're talking about. So other people can look at it and they can change it if they want. And from that day onwards, it works again. Uh, without wearing out, and it gives even better results. So, models are worth investment. Thank you. So, I guess, stand in front of the microphone, just a, a few reflections on the day, um, and, um, and I'll keep this brief. Uh, so, the first thing uh, I thought about was the messages from our practitioners in the morning sessions. So, the people, the farmers, and the people who are working closely with farmers. Uh, and they talked about unashamedly stolen from your slides, folks. Um, people, planet, performance. And I've just kind of expanded those out a bit more. We talked about the importance of people, and I think we've reflected on that during the day. There were questions about what's stopping data interoperability, and the answer was people. 
Uh, there were questions about how do we get adoption. Uh, we talked about the need for specialists. And so a lot of it comes back to the importance of people in our thinking. Uh, mathematical equations are great, but people are very important. Um, planet, we've talked about the need to make sure that we're farming within the constraints that we've got and doing the right things for our land and our planet. Performance and I've added and productivity there. And you know, Martin's questions are good ones. We we want to include we want to we know we often fall into talking about in improving production, right? And we know we don't want to talk about improving production. We want to talk about improving productivity the measure of what we're getting out and at the bottom line measure of that is profit as long as the the other factors are equal um, for the amount of inputs put in and for the uh, amount of emissions going out um, then something that i got out of those farmers who talked this morning is their strong emphasis on planning on the processes that they and their teams follow the communication of those processes and the precision with which they go and measure, they, they identify what are the important things for them to measure in their systems and they go and measure them. And to, together that, you know, that was talked about as systematization, turning things into a system that's repeatable and I think that's, that's key. So some great, great learnings for me in those areas today. Um, we talked, for those who are involved in um, research and in governance, we talked about capabilities. And I guess my reflection, um, thinking about uh, some of the presentations, was the amount of amazing capability that we've had leveraged in this sector over many years in our science R&D and all of the, the things that underpin that, um, some fantastic capability. And I think that goes to the heart of what you were talking about before, Graham, um, other countries are investing in their core competencies and in New Zealand we've made a lot of investment, not, not enough, but a lot of investment in building capability in pastoral agriculture and its underpinnings, which has been fantastic. There's some really valuable collections. We talked about the virtual climate stations, we talked about SMAPs, and we've talked about some of the other collections that are out there. Um, I didn't want to just say databases because there's a lot more than just databases. Um, almost every speaker talked about the opportunity to collaborate further, to engage further, to use data from other sources, whether that's climate stations or soils data or any of the other data sets that are potential to use, um, and the opportunity to engage together. And we see that. We see that in some of the collaborative projects that have been done. We talked a bit, little bit about data integration, and to me there's some real benefits in being able to link data and to have common identifiers and all of those necessary things that make it easier to connect the dots between systems and also consistency in meaning and interpretation and are we talking about the same things. Uh, and then this afternoon we talked about our, and you, you know, I'm playing some fun games here, but we talked a, we talked a little bit about um, uh, sensing. We started off by talking from space, which is very much built on sensing technologies. But I thought, particularly when I was listening to Dean as well, there's a, there's, that's another great example of sourcing data uh, so that farmers aren't having to go and measure it. You know, imagine if you as a farmer, and farmers did have to do this, some still do, go and attend every sale yard that they can so that they know what the prices are. Try and keep their own little books so that they know, you know where prices are heading. But there are tools that can deliver that data just as space can deliver pasture cover data. Um, and, and I think we saw through the work that Ravensdown and Balance are doing a bunch of other sensing and use of predictive tools to take some of the effort that farmers would have out of sort of capturing data and making sense of it. A lot of the tools we looked at, uh, including FarmMax and including the tools that, that Ravensdown and Balance have been working on, have been around making predictions that help people make either recommendations or decisions, and that's really powerful. And I think there was, there's been some, again, a thread of discussion going through around, well, how do we then extend those services out? 
If you've got other, other crops you want to measure with, with space, how do you do that? Can we extend those services? If you've got some data that's in FarmMax or one of these other tools, how do we make it available? How do we make data flow into FarmMax? I think my other observation is that we're still at the stage where many of these tools, maybe space being an exception here, require the assistance of somebody, a specialist, to help interpret them. Right? Whether that's a, a rep or an agri-manager in a fertiliser company, and we know there's good reasons why we should be doing that, uh, or, or a consultant to help you with farm max. And, and I'm not saying, you know, we know those roles are essential and important, but if we're to move to support for adoption and use, we need to think about how we kind of leverage the time of those people, right? So that they're doing the things that only they can do, and that our tools and our systems are easier to use, so that um, specialists don't have to get involved at every step in the way. So I guess that's my kind of reflections on what we've talked about today. I hope that, like me, this has been of interest to you, that you've had your eyes opened to some interesting things that people have been doing and some opportunities. Um, I think it's been great to have the input from the farmers and the practitioners to kind of ground truth what the problems are that we're trying to solve. And what we're hoping is that this conversation continues on. So if you're on Zoom or if you're here in the room, hopefully you've made some contacts or you've made some notes of people you should talk to, and we'd really encourage you to continue to do that. If there's any way that Rosier can f facilitate those discussions for you, we're happy to do that as well. So thank you very much.